Hello everyone, a very good morning and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to our daily Hindu analysis. So let's begin by taking a look at the topics we're going to discuss today. We have three important articles from page number 7 and page number 12. A couple of them are from international relations and one article from science and technology. All the three articles are very very important for our mains as well as for the prelims. And after we complete a detailed analysis of these articles, we shall take a look at few prelims oriented articles around five topics covering different subjects. So just stay with me for the next one hour, one hour, ten minutes. I promise to cover all these topics comprehensively as thoroughly as possible. So you don't have to go back and read these topics again. All you have to do is support us back by pressing that like button, share your comments and without fail subscribe to our channel because we have some exciting initiatives coming up which are specifically designed for the upcoming prelims and we'll make the announcement very soon hopefully by tomorrow also join the telegram channel because as soon as the session ends we'll have few questions on the same topics so that you can revise these topics again so let's get started with the analysis of today's the hindu newspaper by looking at an important article from page number seven according to this article there have been reports that China has accelerated its military activities in the Indian Ocean, which is posing a considerable risk for India's influence and India's strategic interests in the Indian Ocean. Apparently, in Myanmar and as well as in Sri Lanka, both of whom are very important neighboring countries of India, in these countries, reportedly, China is carrying out certain activities which actually serve a dual purpose. These are dual use facilities which are being built and constructed by China. The term dual use refers to anything which has a dual application, a civilian application and as well as a military application. For example, we have dual use items, dual use technologies, which have civilian applications and military applications like semiconductor technology, battery technology, etc. Similarly, the construction activities of a particular country can have or can serve dual purposes. Let's say a country like China is building a port or a runway in a, in a certain country. Of course, these projects can be used for connectivity, for improving trade, for improving economic opportunities. Thus, they serve a civilian purpose. But the same projects could be put to a dual use they could acquire a military angle if the armed forces of that country will make use of these facilities. So such facilities reportedly are coming up in Myanmar and Sri Lanka and they pose a direct security threat to India. According to the reports, at the strategic Koko Islands of Myanmar, China has reportedly accelerated its construction activities which is believed to be a major military facility designed to target India, to step up surveillance against India and potentially turn this into a Chinese military outpost in the strategic Bay of Bengal. There are also reports that China has proposed a satellite receiving ground station, essentially a satellite tracking system in Sri Lanka, in southern Sri Lanka, which potentially could be used to spy on India. So both these upcoming projects and these ongoing activities in Myanmar and Sri Lanka have raised security concerns for India. So let's examine this topic in complete detail because Coco Islands are strategically located in Bay of Bengal and the topic in itself is very, very important. There's also a lot of controversy and conspiracy theories surrounding Coco Island as well. There are many conspiracy theorists who argue that Coco Islands belong to India. It was gifted away by India to Myanmar. Let's burst all those myths. Let's understand the history of Coco Islands, the geography and the geopolitical significance. And similarly, we shall take a look at the satellite tracking station proposed in Sri Lanka, how it poses a security threat and what measures is India taking to counter the rising Chinese threat in the Indian Ocean. Of course, we shall be examining the geopolitical conflict between India and China as far as the Indian Ocean is concerned. Now, if you look at the maps that I've shared here, the Coco Islands, which are in news, they are a group of strategic islands present to the north of India's Andaman Nicobar Islands. To the north of India's Andaman Nicobar Islands, you find the small group of islands. It's an archipelago of islands. 
these are referred to as the cocoa islets it's roughly ro located around 400 kilometers to the south of yongon yongon is a major commercial center a port center in myanmar located over here around 400 kilometers kilometers to the south of it in bay of bengal in the northeast bay of bengal this is where cocoa islands is located it's made up of the great cocoa island little cocoa island to the north you also have the table island and few other smaller islands that are scattered around over here to be more precise the cocoa islands they consist of five islands it's a group of five islands there are four on the great cocoa reef and one on the little cocoa reef and this is located between the preparous island of Myanmar and the landfall island of Andaman Nicobar Islands which belongs to India this is the precise location of the strategic cocoa islands landfall island is the northernmost island of India in the Andaman Nicobar group of islands slightly to the north of it just a few kilometers hardly 50 to 60 kilometers from there you find the cocoa group of islands as you can see cocoa islands are quite close to strategic locations in India and apparently Myanmar has leased the cocoa islands to China back in 1994 so since the last 30 years apparently China has some presence and control over cocoa islands it has constructed several facilities which have raised concerns for India and of late the construction activity has been scaled up these are military level construction military grade construction including runways port facilities radar facilities so this gives rise to allegations and suspicion that China is turning Cocoa Islands into a strategic surveillance base against India. Because India has very sensitive locations along the coastline over here. If you look at the Andaman Nicobar Islands, these islands itself have great strategic value because of their proximity to the Malacca Strait. And over the Andaman Nicobar Islands, there is a tri-service command of the Indian Armed Forces where the Indian Army, Navy and Air Force operate together under a single unified tri-service command. This is a major military outpost of India. Plus, India has a lot of exclusive economic zone with precious resources and these islands are of great strategic significance. It gives India the ability to dominate the Malacca Strait, which is a choke point, especially for China. Because China depends heavily on the Malacca Strait, present near Singapore and Indonesia. Lot of oil imports from West Asia to China passes through the Malacca Strait. So India has a dominant military position over here at the Andaman Nicobar Islands and obviously China would be interested to step up its presence and monitor these activities. Then if you look at mainland India, the Indian subcontinent, we have many important strategic facilities located on the east coast of India. For example, in Odisha, we have the integrated test range, the missile test range over the Abdul Kalam Islands, the APG Abdul Kalam Islands in the Balsor district of Odessa. This is where the DRDO tests India's ballistic missiles. Correct? Then Vishakapatnam is another strategic location. Along with being a major port, there is a critical naval base of the Indian Navy and this is where our INS Arihant class of submarines are stationed. India's nuclear powered submarines are stationed and built over here in Vishakapatnam. Then you have Srihari Kota, the only space port of India, operated by ISRO. Then Chennai, a major city, a naval base and an important major port as well. Along with several critical locations and installations all along the coastline, including nuclear power plants. The Kundankulam nuclear power plant, Kalpakam nuclear plant. Right? So such important strategic locations are present including ports, naval bases, missile test range facilities, the space port of India, nuclear plants, etc. The Indian Navy is very proactive in this water belt over here in the Bay of Bengal and in, in such a strategically vital region, China is seen to be stepping up its presence with help from Myanmar. Just yesterday we spoke about the situation in Myanmar. I explained how Myanmar is very close to China. Even though India has good relations with Myanmar, Myanmar's military leadership, they rely heavily on China. China has a lot of leverage on the military janta. It has a lot of investments in the country as well. So this is what gives rise to fears that China is leveraging its geopolitical advantages and 
gaining military strategic advantages, especially to encircle India and to contain India. Now, if you look at this map, which is giving you the broader strategic picture here, you can essentially visualize the India-China competition in the Indian Ocean. Since early 2000, at least from 2003-2005, we have seen a sudden surge in Chinese presence and influence all across the Indian Ocean. Traditionally, India has been the dominant power in the Indian Ocean region. Is that clear? India has been the most dominant economic power, military power all across the Indian Ocean. But China has managed to step up its presence and influence in the last two decades. There are other global powers and extra regional powers as well which have influence here. For example, if you look at the map, you can see this small island here, the Diego Garcia Island, which is part of the Chagos group of islands. This is a British Indian Ocean Territory. It belongs to Britain. But Britain has leased this island to the United States after the Second World War. And at Diego Garcia, the US has a major military base. The US and even Britain are major naval powers of the Indian Ocean. Even France has a territory over here near Madagascar called French Reunion or La Reunion. So there are extra regional powers and global powers as well, which have a very strong military presence and diplomatic influence all across the Indian Ocean. The US has a very active military presence all across West Asia, from Kuwait to Bahrain to Afghanistan, right across the Arabian Peninsula. The US has a very strong military presence. This region faces a number of threats, including terrorism, piracy, especially near Horn of Africa over here, near the Somalian coast. Plus, there are conflicts and civil wars going on in several countries such as Yemen, for example, Somalia, for example, right? So many powers are interested to, they're interested in dominating the Indian Ocean for strategic reasons and geopolitical reasons. The region is blessed with resources. It's the focal point of the global economy today. It's very much part of the larger Indo-Pacific. So India, which has been a traditional power here, has been facing stiff competition from China. If you look at the map over here, you can identify three important choke points one of them is the Malacca Strait, which I was talking about earlier, near Singapore and Indonesia. The other one is the Hormuz Strait over here, between Iran and United Arab Emirates, which connects the vital Persian Gulf, which is the source of oil supplies for most countries. It connects the Persian Gulf with the Gulf of Oman, which is connected with the Arabian Sea over here. So Hormuz Strait is another key choke point. It's a very narrow water body linking Persian Gulf with the Gulf of Omar. Then you have Bab al Mandeb Strait over here. The Bab al Mandeb Strait, a narrow opening connecting the Gulf of Aden with the Red Sea. It's a vital shipping lane. All these choke points are important sea lanes of communication. They are critical for global shipping. The global economy is heavily dependent on these choke points. Malacca Strait is a vital link between Indian Ocean and the Pacific, right? It links the Andaman Sea with South China Sea over here. The Hormuz Strait is extremely crucial for the global economy, especially because of oil supplies. All the major oil producing nations of West Asia are present around the Persian Gulf and all the oil shipments passes through Hormuz Strait and reaches Gulf of Oman. The Gulf of Aden and Red Sea is a vital shipping lane connecting Asia with Europe. It's the most viable and most practically feasible shipping route that passes through the Suez Canal over here, linking Mediterranean Sea and Atlantic on the other side with the Indian Ocean on the other side. So Bab al Mandeb Strait present here is another choke point. So all across these important choke points, India, US, China, Japan, European countries, they all have a major military diplomatic presence to protect their respective interests. China in particular has posed a serious challenge for India, especially through its so-called string of pearls strategy. It's believed that China has this strategy called string of pearls, which is designed to encircle India. Reportedly, China is investing in a number of commercial projects all across the Indian Ocean. And these commercial projects apparently serve a dual purpose. They could be easily turned into potential military bases for the PLA Navy, 
which allows China to counter the Indian influence. So all across this region, there are many such projects of China. You can just take a look at, a, at, at these projects in the map. You have the Kyokfu port in Myanmar, which is part of China-Myanmar economic corridor project, which is part of the Belt and Road Initiative. It has invested in key projects in Bangladesh as well, including Chittagong port and Sonadia project. It's working with Thailand to create a kennel over here called the Kra Kennel. This is the Kra Isthmus. As you can see in the map, Thailand becomes very narrow over here, right next to the Andaman Nicobar Islands of India. And China plans to cut across Thailand, across the Kra Isthmus, and break open and create an artificial kennel like the Suez Kennel or Panama Kennel. This will directly link South China Sea with the Andaman Sea and Bay of Bengal, thus reducing China's dependency on Malacca Strait. Similarly, China-Myanmar Economic Corridor also helps China bypass Malacca Strait and through Myanmar and Kyokfu port, China can directly access Bay of Bengal and Indian Ocean. All right, then it has built the strategic Hambantota port and Colombo port in Sri Lanka. It has built the Gwadar port in Pakistan and also developed the Karachi port as well as part of China-Pakistan economic corridor as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. China has gained access to the Dukum port in Oman. Even Indian Navy has gained access to the Dukum port in Oman. China has set up a foreign military base, its first foreign military base here in Djibouti, right next to Babel Mandeb Strait. In fact, at Djibouti, many countries have a foreign military base. US, Japan, European countries and China. All these countries have naval bases at Djibouti to stabilize the Babel Mandeb Strait, which is a critical shipping point. And in Maldives, China has gained control over the Marau Atoll and the Fyodu Finolu Island. The Fyodu Finolu Island has been leased by Maldives to China, where China is creating commercial connectivity projects, including runways and port facilities. So it's widely believed that these commercial projects of China could be turned into military bases that could encircle India. And this is China's string of pearl strategy. All right. We will talk about India's counter as well. We will talk about the measures taken by India to counter the Chinese presence. But now with this broad understanding, let's focus on the Cocoa Islands. What exactly is China doing here? What's the history of Cocoa Islands? And let's also talk about the satellite tracking station that China is looking to set up in Sri Lanka. So that is the next part of my discussion. If you look at Cocoa Islands, there is a rich history and geography behind it that plays a direct role in today's geopolitics as well. As I told you earlier, there is a, a controversy, a conspiracy theory that India gifted away Cocoa Islands to Myanmar. However, however this is largely a fake story. It's a, a conspiracy theory, as I said. Let's break that myth. Let's see what the actual history is with regard to Cocoa Islands. The term Cocoa in itself is a Portuguese term. It refers to coconut. The island is known for its coconut plantations. So during colonial period, around the 16th, 17th century, Portuguese sailors, they used to frequent these islands and they started calling it the Cocoa Islands. So during the colonial period and even during medieval times, a lot of traders, pirates, smugglers, merchants, they have often used Cocoa Islands because it was located in a strategic point on the trade routes connecting India with Southeast Asia. Later, the British took over the Andaman Islands the whole stretch of Andaman Nicobar Islands and obviously Cocoa Islands was very much a part of the same group of islands. So in the 18th century, the East India Company established almost complete control over these group of islands. And as you know, the British, they set up a penal colony in the Andamans, right? They set up the infamous jail at Port Blair, where they would lodge Indian freedom fighters, decoits, criminals, etc. And the British mainly set this up as an outpost, a strategic outpost, along with a penal colony. The Cocoa Islands were the main source of food supply for Andaman Nicobar at that point of time. Because of the coconut plantations that were present here, coconuts were supplied from Cocoa Islands to Andaman Nicobar during the British era. The British even tried to create a settlement colony at Cocoa Islands, but they couldn't do it. Due to the geographical difficulties in accessing the island, they couldn't supervise and administer the Cocoa Islands effectively. So due to these practical administrative problems, 
the Coco group of islands which are administered through Calcutta and Andaman and Nicobar, they were transferred, the jurisdiction was transferred along with the Table Island to Rangon, that is to Burma. Burma was also a British colony, but the administrations were different. In 1882, the Coco Islands were formally made a part of British Burma. So as you can see, they were never a part of British India exactly. For a short period, yes, it was seen as part of the larger Andaman Nicobar Islands, but the British quickly transferred the Coco Islands to Burma, to British Burma, and it very much became a part of Burma. In 1937, when Burma was separated from India, the British Burma colony was made a completely separate colony from British India, these islands were made part of the British Crown Colony, a self-governing Crown Colony, and eventually it was made part of the British colony of Burma. Then during the Second World War, when the Japanese had reached Southeast Asia and almost close to Indian borders in Northeast India, the Japanese took over the Cocoa Islands for a brief period. Imperial Japan, which had aligned with the fascist uh, access, uh, access of evil powers, including Germany and Italy, right? After committing atrocities all across Southeast Asia, Right? Ja the Japanese forces, they reached Cocoa Islands and took control over Cocoa Islands for a short period. Eventually, after the Second World War, after Japan was defeated, Britain regained control over these group of islands and this which was part of the Burmese British administration was made part of independent Burma in 1948. So the question of India giving away this island never arises. It was never part of Indian territory to begin with. All right, The British colony, the British administration, had largely kept this as part of the British Burma colony. It wasn't seen as part of the Andaman Nicobar territory. All right. So while Andaman Nicobar became an integral part of the Indian Union during independence, Cocoa Islands became an integral part of Burma post-independence in 1948. So Myanmar obviously has a major military facility here. It's critical for Myanmar's air force and navy. And apparently, it has leased these islands in 1994 to China, to the People's Republic of China. And constantly, China has supplied funds, provided technical support, and it has created strategic infrastructure on these islands. Satellite imagery clearly showed the military activities taking place on these islands. That is exactly what the article is also talking about. This is not something new. India knew about this since decades. We have been closely monitoring the Coco Islands from at least 30-40 years and we have kept a close eye on China's activities over these islands. But recent satellite pictures they show advanced construction taking place. Okay, these are actual images of Coco Islands, satellite pictures that I've shared here. You can see the construction of a runway. It's a very mature and a full length runway from where fighter jets can take off. Even large transport aircraft can easily take off from here. You can see jetty facilities as well, a mini port-like facility where naval ships can dock. Quite often, Myanmar conducts naval and air exercises over here, where Myanmar's Navy and Air Force, they bring their assets to the Cocoa Islands. Along with that, you can see the creation of accommodation facilities, large buildings and radar dome structures as well, along with air defense systems. Air defense systems are put in place. There are hangars which have been built, which can house fighter jets and large aircraft. Large naval ships and submarines can dock at the jetties which have been created. All right. And radar dome structures are clearly visible, thus pointing to advanced military infrastructure being created on Cocoa Islands. Now, if these were just Myanmar's military facilities, it wouldn't have been a problem to India. Because Myanmar is a very good friend of India, we actually have very close military defense ties with Myanmar. India supplies weapons to Myanmar. We have gifted a, a submarine recently to Myanmar's Navy. We conduct joint exercises, joint operations as well. So India and Myanmar have very close security ties. If Myanmar alone had access and control to these islands, that wouldn't have been a problem. The problem arises for India due to suspicion that China has access to the islands. It's believed that these facilities have been created with direct Chinese support, with Chinese funds, Chinese technical support and the whole construction and infrastructure activity has been executed by China. This is what leads to concerns for India that China is stepping up its military presence right next to India's back door. 
The fear here is that China could easily monitor India's military activities, the testing of missiles at uh, the Balsor facilities by DRDO, the satellite launches at Sri Kota, the nuclear bases of India, the power stations, major ports and the naval bases of India. They're all present along uh, the east coast. The Andaman Nicobar is a major military outpost of India where we have a tri-service command, right? With capabilities to block Malacca Strait if required to put pressure on China. Right? Hypothetically, it is possible for India to block out the Malacca Strait. Plus, you have US which has a major military presence, which has been a, a very close defense partner for India. India off late has aligned with Japan, Australia and US. All of them are major military powers with capabilities to block the Malacca Strait. If there are ever hostilities with China, one strategy to punish China, to weaken China would be to block out the Malacca Strait. Because China has critical dependency on Malacca Strait. Most of its oil imports from West Asia passes through Malacca Strait. So that explains why China is so aggressive in building up its influence and creating alternate routes to Indian Ocean by bypassing the Malacca Strait. On similar lines, there is a proposed Chinese project in Sri Lanka, in southern Sri Lanka, where a satellite tracking station is likely to come up. Indian intelligence agencies are closely keeping a watch on these developments. Because Sri Lanka, under the Rajpaksa brothers, when Rajpaksa brothers were in power, had firmly aligned with China, even allowing Chinese military vessels to dock in Sri Lankan ports. A few years ago, in 2011-2012, Chinese nuclear submarines were allowed to dock at Colombo, despite India's protests. Recently, just last year, just few months back, a Chinese spy vessel called Yong Wong 5, which you can see in the image here, which is a mobile satellite tracking uh, uh, station or a facility, was allowed to dock at Hambantota port in Sri Lanka despite objections from India. So China has a lot of leverage over Sri Lanka. A Chinese company has a long-term lease over Hambantota port in southern Sri Lanka. Because Sri Lanka couldn't repay the loans it had borrowed for building the Hambantota port. It's believed to be a part of China's debt trap diplomacy. And eventually, a Chinese company has gained a long-term lease, a 99-year lease of Hambantota port. So the fear has always been that China will use these commercial facilities for a dual purpose, which is for a military purpose. So now a satellite tracking station has been proposed. And please understand that satellite tracking facilities, they are inherently dual purpose in nature. They not only help in tracking civilian rocket launches and satellites, they could be used to track enemy satellites to carry out reconnaissance surveillance against enemy space facilities as well. So a satellite tracking facility of China so close to India has raised fears that it could be used to spy on Indian assets, intercept India's encrypted sensitive military communication and information that poses a great strategic threat for India. All right. So these are the developments which have been noted by several strategic experts and Indian intelligence agencies. And that is what has been reported in the article. Now, let me tell you what exactly India is doing to counter the rising Chinese influence and aggression. For example, at the Andaman Nicobar Tri-Service Command, India has stepped up its military capabilities. All the three armed forces, the Navy, Air Force and the Army, are operating jointly under a single command with enhanced capabilities. They have developed sea denial capabilities specifically designed to block out Malacca Strait if the need ever arises. India is essentially in a position in a geographical and as well as in a military position to block out Malacca Strait, to place a naval blockade so that we could put pressure on China if the need ever arises. India is upgrading its military infrastructure over here. The airport at Shippur and North Andamans, including the Campbell Airport. These are vital air bases for the Indian Air Force and the Indian Navy. They are being upgraded to accommodate fighter jets. They have been turned into full-fledged fighter air bases accommodating the Rafales, the Sukhoi 30s and such advanced platforms. India has deployed anti-submarine warfare equipment and military assets at the Andaman Nicobar. For example, we have the P-8 Poseidon aircraft, the P-8I Poseidon aircraft and other anti-submarine warfare helicopters as well, which can track and hunt submarines. So to tackle the threat of Chinese submarines, anti-submarine warfare capabilities have been developed at the Andaman Nicobar command. Frequently, Chinese spy balloons are spotted here, similar to how the spy balloon incident happened in the US. So India is looking for help from US to deal with such 
spy balloon incidents, how to shoot them down, how to bring them down. So these are the challenges we are facing and India is gearing up to the challenge. On the other hand, towards the Arabian Sea as well, we are leveraging the strategic Lakshadweep Islands for our military operations. At Agati, advanced military facilities are being created so that all the way from Malacca Strait to Babel Mandeb Strait, India can step up its military dominance of the region from Bay of Bengal to Arabian Sea. All right. The Indian Navy frequently works with foreign navies, friendly navies in the region and beyond to stabilize the region. The Quad countries, that is India, US, Japan and Australia, they have a major naval exercise, the Malabar naval exercise. As you saw, US has a major military base. Japan and Australia frequently deploy their navy over here. Friendly European countries as well, like France, um, UK, Italy, Germany, even they deploy their navies constantly over here. So we tie up with them, we work with them, we work with our regional partners as well. India has very close military ties with Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, then Thailand, Singapore, right? With Maldives, Mauritius and Seychelles, with all these Indian Ocean countries, East African countries as well, like Mozambique, Tanzania and Kenya. So India has very close military arrangements with all these countries. We frequently deploy our Navy all across the waters to establish India's dominant position. India has stepped up its submarine underwater capabilities along with advanced military assets including drones, surveillance equipment, etc. The Lakshadweep that sits on the 9 degree channel and the Andaman Nicobar that straddles across the 6 degree and 10 degree channel. These critical water lanes or shipping lanes are being dominated by India and that is how India is stepping up to China's influence. All right. On a theater command basis, the tri services, all three services are focusing on operating together in this region from Lakshadweep to Andaman, from Malacca Strait to Babal Mandeb Strait to establish India's dominant presence. Even ISRO has its own set of satellite tracking stations all across the region. All right. These satellite tracking stations, they serve a civilian purpose. They help in tracking India's rocket launches and satellites. And it also serves a dual purpose, a military purpose to carry out surveillance, to carry out intelligence gathering. So India's satellite tracking stations are present, not just in India, not just in Bengaluru, Lucknow and Sri Kota and Port Blair. We have taken the help of foreign countries, friendly foreign nations like Mauritius, then Brunei, Indonesia. All right. So in these countries as well, India's satellite tracking stations have come up. We already have a satellite tracking station in Mauritius in Brunei and at Biak in Indonesia. We have proposed similar stations in Bhutan and Vietnam. Both countries have agreed to allow ISRO to set up satellite tracking stations in Bhutan and Vietnam. So this roughly represents India's counter to the rising military presence of China. Plus we have created close security partnership with all the major Indian Ocean countries. With Mauritius and Seychelles, India has stepped up its military cooperation we have even gained access to strategic islands such as the Agalega Island of Mauritius and the Assumption Island of Seychelles. We have also created a security partnership called the Colombo Security Conclave that brings the national security advisors of India, Sri Lanka, Maldives and Mauritius together. All right, India, Sri Lanka, Maldives and Mauritius. These four countries have created a very close security arrangement called Colombo Security Conclave. Even Seychelles, Bangladesh and Myanmar are interested to join the Colombo Security Conclave. We have created such regional groupings as well. And through other regional initiatives like IORA, Indian Ocean RIM Association and IONS, Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. Through all such regional initiatives, India is stepping up its diplomatic presence as well. So this represents India's counter to the rising presence and influence of China. All right. I know it's a very big discussion, but trust me, it's a very important topic for your mains, even for your prelims. We have covered many, many important related topics so that we have a comprehensive idea about the India China competition in the Indian Ocean. Now, moving on to the next article from page number seven, again, from international relations. It's related to the fishermen issue between India and Pakistan. In both the countries, hundreds of fishermen have been arrested, detained, they've been spending months and years in jail and there is no respite for them. The tense relations between India and Pakistan 
has had a direct impact on the fishermen who are jailed in both the countries. All right. So their families have been appealing to both the countries to release them and ensure justice is done to them on the grounds of human rights. So let's look at this issue in slight detail because this is another major issue affecting India-Pakistan ties. It's been there from many decades and it continues to affect the relationship between the two countries. Every now and then, Indian fishermen tend to cross over the international maritime boundary line and enter Pakistani waters. Similarly, Pakistani fishermen inadvertently they cross over into Indian waters and they breach the maritime border present over here in the Arabian Sea. All right. Quite often they are caught by the authorities on the other side. The Indian Coast Guard, Indian Navy will apprehend the Pakistani fishermen. Similarly, Pakistan's maritime agencies, they will arrest and detain Indian fishermen. They lodge them in jails, file cases against them for violating the Passport Act and eventually they are convicted in courts. A jail term is given, they are sentenced for a few months or maybe a few years and even after they serve the jail term, they are not released and returned on time. Is that clear? Even after serving the jail term, lot of prisoners get left behind due to the tense relations and the lack of diplomatic cooperation. Many of these prisoners are not returned back, they are not sent back. So as a result, hundreds of Indian fishermen are trapped in Pakistan, hundreds of Pakistani fishermen are trapped in Indian jails. So this has become a major issue and the families of these fishermen are appealing to both the countries to release them on time. Ensure that their basic rights are protected. Because in most cases, the fishermen are crossing over without knowledge. It's not a deliberate incursion. Because you don't have clear-cut boundaries in the open seas. Right? There are no physical markers of the boundary. Fishermen, they lack the awareness, they lack the navigation equipment, technical skills. Without knowing, sometimes they cross over into waters on the other side. Right? So this is leading to a diplomatic issue as well between the two countries. And this broader fisherman issue is partly tied to a boundary dispute that we have here, which is the Sir Creek dispute. The fisherman dispute gets aggravated because of the Sir Creek dispute. All right. The Sir Creek dispute is a long standing dispute between India and Pakistan. Just like the Siachen dispute, the Kashmir dispute, the Sir Creek is one of the disputes that we have. Here you can see the Kutch region of India, which is in Gujarat. This is the Sindh region of Pakistan. All right. And you can see the international border, which is a permanent settled boundary between India, Pakistan, stretching all the way from Punjab to Rajasthan and Gujarat. This settled boundary between India, Pakistan, the land border is the international border. In Jammu and Kashmir, you have a temporary de facto border, which is LOC, the line of control. Right? As the Kashmir dispute continues and Pakistan remains in the illegal occupation of Indian territory, we have a temporary de facto border in JK, which is the LOC, the line of control. But across Punjab, Rajasthan, and Gujarat, we have a settled border, which is the IB or international border. At the last stretch over here, where IB reaches the Kutch Sindh region here, in the last stretch of the Indus Basin, this is the Indus River Basin itself, we have an estuary, it's a tidal estuary called Sir Creek. There is a 100-year-old dispute over here. The Sir Creek dispute is a 100-year-old dispute. Both India and Pakistan have counterclaims over the Sir Creek region. India's claim is the orange line that you can see here, which is passing in the middle. India wants the international principles and laws under UN clause to be followed to draw up the boundaries here. Because this has implications for drawing up the maritime boundaries as well for determining the exclusive economic zones of both the countries. India wants a very fair solution here. We want the Talweg principle or the Talweg doctrine to be followed. The Talweg principle is a customary shipping law which is recognized by UN clause as well. According to Talweg principle, if there is a water body dividing two countries, the boundary, the border is supposed to pass in the middle of the channel. So that both the sides get an equal share, a fair share of the water body. This is the Talvek principle. According to Talvek principle, which is recognized internationally under UN clause, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, if a water body marks the boundary between two countries, the border will pass in the middle of the channel. That is exactly what India is claiming. But Pakistan rejects this 
and it's claiming the whole Sir Creek estuary to itself. The green line here represents Pakistani claims. Pakistan is claiming whole Sir Creek to itself, whereas India is only claiming half of it as per the Talwik principle. These counterclaims has led to the dispute, it remains an unresolved dispute and it has implications for the broader maritime borders as well. For settling the maritime border here between Gujarat and Sindh, the Sir Creek dispute has implications because depending on how the Sir Creek issue is resolved, the EEZ of both the countries will vary. Right? Countries have exclusive rights over economic resources present in the EEZ of their country. Be it fisheries, hydrocarbons, precious minerals, etc. All those resources belong exclusively to that country, to that coastal state. Right? These are governed by the UN clause provisions. So this remains a standing dispute, one of the minor disputes between India and Pakistan and it actually traces a 100 year old journey. It was actually a result of a dispute between the princely states of Kutch and Sindh during the British era. In 1908 itself, under the Bombay presidency, the Bombay province, between Kutch and Sindh, a major dispute came up over how to draw up the boundaries over here in the run of Kutch region, which is a marshy area. See, the land itself is not of much importance. It's a largely a wasteland, marshy area, and you have the salt plains as well right next to it. But Back in 1908, a dispute ar arose between the Kutch and the Sindh uh, provinces over here, which continued throughout the colonial period. The then Bombay government here came out with a map, which gave a confused version of the boundary. According to the map, the eastern bank of the creek was drawn as the boundary between Kutch and Sindh. But the agreement says under para 10 that the middle of the channel is where the border will pass through. So there is confusion within this 1914 agreement, which was brought out by the Bombay administration at that point. All right, the map shows that eastern bound, the eastern bank or the eastern flank of the Sir Creek is the boundary, which means if you continue that claim, then Pakistan will get the whole Sir Creek region. But in the same agreement, in the same document under para 10, it has been mentioned that the boundary passes in the middle of the channel, which is India's claims according to Talwik principle. So there is confusion over here. This is the prime source of the dispute. It was a major error under the British administration. So this has been inherited post-independence. It has been a, a point of conflict. In 1965, both the forces clashed as well during the 1965 war. In 1968, a tribunal between India and Pakistan passed an award settling the boundaries in this region but without covering Sir Creek. In the run of Kutch area, there was no clarity on the boundary. So a tribunal had been set up, India-Pakistan tribunal, which settled the boundary here. But the Sir Creek issue was not covered. Since then, both countries have continued to have a dialogue every now and then. They have set up joint teams as well to conduct surveys, to map out the area and suggest solutions. But till date, we haven't found a solution to the Sir Creek issue. Since the issue continues to persist, the boundaries are not very clear here in the Kutch and Sindh region. Right? This extends into the Arabian Sea as well, the maritime border, the international border is not very clear. So as a result, fishermen cross over, get arrested and they spend years in jail. That is the reason why the issue comes up again and again. One solution is to spread awareness amongst the fish fishermen, to train them better, to give them uh, navigation kits, right? so that they know where they are, so that they identify their position, ensure they don't cross over into Pakistani waters. That's what Indian Navy, Indian Coast Guard have done. They have procured communication kits and navigation kits from ISRO. These are GPS enabled kits which allows the fishing boats to know where they are and they get to know if they cross the boundary line. So Navy and Coast Guard are playing a role in training the fishermen and spreading awareness with them to install the tracking equipment. Pakistan also has made attempts to do this. But both the sides have failed to do this on a large scale. The issue keeps happening every now and then. Even today, fishermen get detained and arrested. And hundreds of fishermen are languishing in jails even after serving the jail term. They haven't been returned. So that is the source of the dispute and tensions here. So families of both the sides are approaching the governments, urging them to release the prisoners and to solve the dispute forever. Alright? Now coming to the next article from page number 10, or uh, page number 12. It's a topic from science and technology related to the super material, the wonder material that is graphene. 
graphene is often referred to as the wonder material or a or as a super material because graphene has some amazing properties it it has some very unique properties compared to any other material and as a result it finds numerous applications in various industries so this article here is dealing with something called magneto resistance all right so let's look at this in slight detail let's understand what is graphene from a prelims point of view let's look at the properties of graphene and its applications as well which could be important for your mains see graphene is essentially a material composed of carbon atoms which are arranged in this honeycomb pattern these are hexagonally positioned in a honeycomb like structure and it is just one atom thick the mono layers which is a result of this arrangement this honeycomb arrangement these layers of carbon atoms it is just one atom thick this is called graphene it's widely found it's abundantly available in graphite graphite is widely used for example in your pencils right then in semiconductor chips there are lot of products which are produced using graphite all right and graphite is naturally found it's widely available and graphite is the source of graphene each millimeter of graphite contains millions of layers of graphene because a graphene material is just one atom thick its thickness is just one atom thick it's in the range of nanometers to picometers so 1 mm of graphite contains around 3 million layers of graphene and this graphene which is arranged in this honeycomb like structure has very very unique properties very interesting properties it has very high thermal conductivity compared to any other material very high electrical conductivity high elasticity and flexibility it is a very strong material and at the same time it is very light in weight it is said to be stronger than steel 200 times stronger than steel similar to the resistance offered by diamond but very very light in weight so just by looking at these characteristics and properties you can imagine the applications its mechanical strength is many times stronger than steel and it's seen as stiffer than even diamond it has greater electrical conductivity than copper it is even transparent which could enable optical transmission better than glass all right it is very transparent ionizing radiation is not affected when it passes through the graphene layer and it's a transparent material with antibacterial cap properties or capabilities bacteria doesn't grow on the surface of graphene thus making graphene suitable for many biomedical applications all right it has higher thermal conductivity it is impermeable it is also seen as a lubricating layer so there are numerous unique properties about graphene which makes it a wonder material a super material so as a result it finds applications in various critical industries in the energy sector for example it's used in the manufacturing of solar cells fuel cells batteries super capacitors etc in the electronics industry it finds a massive application in manufacturing modern displays oled displays in developing various sensors including bio sensors in the field of biomedicine to diagnose dis diseases to provide for targeted drug delivery to provide for targeted drug delivery to specific organs in the human body to carry out diagnosis of various diseases to keep track of important biomarkers and bio parameters all right these sensors produced using graphene are the best suited they are light in weight antibacterial they have antibacterial properties high conductivity elasticity right and extremely strong so it renders itself multiple applications in the electronics industry and in the biomedical industry even with regard to environment conservation it plays a role in desalination plants treating polluted water because it has this unique ability to treat water it plays a role in water treatment as well it can be employed efficiently in water treatment so graphene is this wonder material which has numerous applications across multiple industries all right and in such a wonder material a new unique property has been discovered 
That is what the article is talking about. The article is from the science and technology section. All right. So researchers in the United Kingdom, they have discovered a new unique property of graphene. That is why the topic is in news. Researchers in UK led by Nobel laureate Andre Jim, they have discovered a very unique property of graphene. It essentially has an anomalous giant magneto resistance or GMR at room temperature. All right. This feature, this characteristic or property called giant magneto resistance, it is often seen in other materials at extremely low temperatures. All right. Let me explain this further. Let me just give you some clarity here. See GMR, the property of GMR or giant magneto resistance. This is used to build certain devices, sensors, especially to detect and sense magnetic fields. All right. It is a result of electric resistance of a conductor being affected by magnetic fields in the adjacent materials. Now, if you take a conductor, for example, place a conductor in between and on both the sides, you have ferromagnetic materials like iron, which attracts magnets. If you magnetize these materials in the same direction, the conductor and the ferromagnetic materials present on the on the side, if you magnetize them in the same direction, the electrical the electrical resistance of the conductor becomes low. If you magnetize these, these objects in the opposite direction, then electrical resistance increases. This property is known as GMR, giant magneto resistance. It is used in GMR based sensors and devices to detect, to sense magnetic fields, which serves a key industrial purpose and an industrial application. All right. Currently, the materials being used for GMR, they have to be kept at extremely low temperatures. All right, they don't function or they don't exhibit GMR properties at room temperature. But graphene has been observed to do this. Graphene has shown the property, the ability to show GMR, this electrical resistance changes depending on the magnetic field changes. It has displayed this at room temperature itself, thus making it a viable alternative. It will take away the requirement for keeping the temperatures low for cooling solutions where GMR based devices and sensors are used. You don't have to use other materials which require extremely low temperatures to detect the magnetic changes in the magnetic directions. This will find huge applications in computers, biosensors, in automotive sensors, etc. Is that clear? The very low temperature conditions are not needed because currently uh, the other materials which are being used in GMR based devices, they require very low temperatures. Whereas graphene is able to display this characteristic at room temperature itself. This is the remarkable discovery. This is the remarkable property of graphene which has been newly discovered. This was not known before. So at room temperature itself, graphene can display GMR properties. All right, so thus making it a viable alternative to replace them with to replace the other materials currently being used that require extremely low temperatures. All right, so just remember this new property that is magneto resistance or giant magneto resistance, which is used in GMR based sensors and devices to sense magnetic fields. All right, so this is what you should understand from this important article. What is graphene? What are its characteristics, its applications and what's the new discovery? All right, very important for your prelims. Even you can expect a mains question here. Next, we'll move to the prelim section. We'll look at the smaller articles relevant for prelims. On page number one, we have an article related to aspirational toilets. This is a very ambitious scheme of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs of the Government of India under Swachh Bharat Mission, under Swachh Bharat 2.0. Across Indian cities, aspirational toilets will be created. The Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs has directed the state governments and local bodies to create advanced toilet facilities. These will be state of the art modern toilet facilities with the best features. All right, they will come up in crowded areas, populated areas, including airports, railway stations, public spaces, along national highways, markets, temples, tourist places, etc. And these toilets 
will be attached with either a library or a cafe or a restaurant so that they can become a self-sustaining model. They will have advanced features. They'll be extremely hygiene. It will have special features for children, for lactating women. It will have contactless facilities to promote hygiene and sanitation. All right. The whole purpose of this initiative is to eradicate open defecation from Indian cities. This is a key goal of Swachh Bharat Mission. To eliminate open defecation in the country, in urban areas. So through this push, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs is working with state governments and local bodies to create these new age toilets with modern, ultra-modern facilities. Alright, they will have automatic flushes, they will have sanitizers, tissues, sanitary pads. So all the basic facilities will be given. It's as if a toilet in a five-star hotel or in a mall or in an airport. Such facilities will be created for the public, free of cost, and they will be made self-sufficient through attaching them with libraries, cafes, and restaurants. All right, they'll have a library or a cafe or a restaurant attached to it. The revenue coming from there will fund the upkeep and maintenance of these aspirational toilets. So there might be a prelims question here regarding the aspirational toilet scheme. It was launched last year in September 2022 as part of Swachh Bharat Mission 2.0. The goal is to make our urban areas open defecation free and the center has allocated 1,41,000 crores for Swachh Bharat Mission 2.0. This is almost two and a half times than the previous budget of the Swachh Bharat mission, the first phase of the mission. And around 6,000 crores has been allocated during the period just for aspirational toilets. All right. The overall budget of Swachh Bharat mission under the second phase is 1,41,600 crore rupees. Out of which around 6,465 crore rupees has been set aside for aspirational toilets initiative. And states will be sharing the budget here, depending on the population of the city. States also have to contribute. Center will provide for a certain contribution. Rest will come from the state governments, depending on the population of the particular city. So under Swachh Bharat Mission, the urban component of Swachh Bharat Mission, around 6,36,000 toilets have been constructed against the earlier target of half a million toilets. So India has exceeded the targets that were set under Swachh Bharat Mission Urban Component. And urban local bodies have played a critical role here and more than 4,300 urban local bodies have been declared as open defecation free. Alright, these are some important points you should know about Swachh Bharat Mission, the second phase of it and the aspirational toilets scheme which is an integral part of Swachh Bharat Mission. Next, on page number 11, we have a couple of articles pointing to the crisis situation in Sudan. Sudan is an African country which has gone through repeated periods of crisis. It has seen multiple coup attempts in the past. And in the last couple of days, few paramilitary forces, rebel forces and the armed forces. They have taken matters into their own hands. There is infighting taking place within the Sudanese armed forces and the government and attempts have been made to topple the government that is located at Khartoum, the capital of Sudan. Alright, Sudan is not new to such civil war conditions and, and military coups. It's a, it's a repeat which has happened in the last many decades. There are few Indians here. In fact, before the recent coup attempts in the last 10 years, there were thousands of Indians in Sudan working in various sectors. But because of the repeated crisis incidents, Indians had fled the country but even today you have few hundred Indians. So the Indian embassy here has issued an advisory asking Indians to stay indoors, not to step outside. The Indian embassy is in close touch with the Indian workers here. It has created a common group so that if required, they can be evacuated before the crisis escalates further. So armed forces and paramilitary units and few rebel groups are fighting against each other for control. And the presidential palace itself reportedly is under attack. All right. So this brings Sudan into question from a prelims point of view. You should know where Sudan is located. There could be a question in prelims based on maps, a places in news question. Sudan opens to the Red Sea over here. All right, it has a coastline towards the Red Sea and it's surrounded by Egypt, Libya, Chad, Central African Republic, South Sudan, which broke away in 2011. 
All right, in 2011, South Sudan broke away from Sudan. Sudan was a much larger country. South Sudan seceded from Sudan due, due to the civil war and became a separate country. It's the youngest and the newest country in the world. Then there is Ethiopia and Eritrea. These are the neighbors of Sudan. And you can see the history of coup attempts in Sudan. There have been repeated attempts to topple the governments. Many successful attempts by the military to capture power. The most recent one being in 2021, where Sudan's dictator was thrown out, toppled, and the military captured power in 2021. And now fresh clashes have begun between the paramilitaries and the rebel groups and the armed forces, thus pushing the country into a deeper crisis. All right, Sudan is known for its oil resources as well. And the capital is Khartoum. So such important facts are very, very important for your prelims. There are Indian workers as well. So from the Indian diaspora point of view, for mains, the topic is relevant. The Indian embassy is in touch. It has warned the Indians to stay inside. And if required, it will be ready to evacuate them as the crisis escalates. The next topic from page number 12, it refers to something called as T cells. All right. According to the article, the Omicron sub variants which have come up, especially the latest variant, which is spreading rapidly in India, it has been able to evade T cell immunity, according to a research article. See, against the Omicron variant, all of us would have gained natural immunity, even through vaccination as well. But still, the new sub variants which are coming up, such as the latest variant, it has been able to evade your T cell immunity. All right, this has been established through research across the world. Multiple researches have taken place on this topic. And the new subvariants, they have been successfully mutated to overcome and bypass the T cell immunity. All right, so that is what the article is talking about. The article actually goes into scientific details, which is not needed for the exam. So I thought at least I would help you understand what are T cells. This is a very, very important prelims topic. T cells are essentially a type of WBCs, white blood cells. They're also referred to as lymphocytes or T lymphocytes. I'm sure you would have heard about this term, lymphocytes or T lymphocytes. It's part of your WBC, it's part of your immune response. And the T cells are a type of white blood cells called lymphocytes. All right, they're part of the immune system and they develop from the stem cells in your bone marrow. Is that clear? They're part of the stem cells, they develop from your stem cells and they play a critical role in giving us immunity against various pathogens, germs, infections and diseases. It even has the ability to help our immune system fight against cancerous development as well. T cells are absolutely essential and integral to our immune system. All right, these white blood cells, these are lymphocytes essentially, T lymphocytes, they offer the basic protection for us against infections, pathogens, harmful infectious diseases, and apparently help us fight against cancerous growth as well. There are two types of T cells, cytotoxic, which destroy the infected cells, and helper T cells that send signals which direct the other immune cells to fight the infection. When a foreign body is detected, the helper T cells send out the signals, signaling the other T cells, the cytotoxic T cells to fight, to fight against the infection which has intruded the body. All right. So these basic facts about T cells are very, very important for your prelims. Next, seventh topic, page number 14. There is a reference to an institution called NFRA, the National Financial Reporting Authority. All right. It has imposed a ban on certain auditing firms for lapses in their auditing accounting standards. So it becomes important to understand what is the National Finance Financial Reporting Authority. You need the basic facts about this key institution. It's a statutory body which has been set up under Section 132 of the Companies Act of 2013. It draws legal backing from here and it's under the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. All right, it's part of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. It has been given statutory backing under Section 132 of the Companies Act. The main task of the National Financial Reporting Authority is to provide accounting and auditing policies and standards for the government and for all companies in India. All right, the auditing accounting standards are laid down by the NFRA for government entities and private entities. 
it will monitor the accounting and auditing standards it will enforce the compliance as well every institution in india right when they carry out accounting and auditing they have to abide by the standards laid down by nfra the national financial reporting authority is that clear it oversees the implementation enforces the accounting and auditing standards comes out with the policies and standards and recommends them to the government and private entities this body is made up of a chairperson and three full time members and one secretary all of whom are appointed by the central government the chairperson and even the members they should have expertise in accounting auditing in finance or law they should have credible experience they should be of imminent uh, value in the society they should have a clear track record with integrity proven integrity so such individuals with significant experience proven experience in accounting auditing or finance and law they are chosen as chairperson and members of this authority and appointed by the government of india all right so nfra is very very important for your prelims coming to the last topic for today on page number 17 the hindu carries a series of images that depicts the beautiful pink flamingos the flamingo is a large wading bird they wade through water all right as you can see here in the picture they wade through water with just one leg on which they stand and they lift the other leg and they wade through water they walk through water where they feed on algae and crustaceans and even small fish so flamingos are a very unique species of bird found in india as well that's why you need to know some important facts about flamingos all right so that is the last topic for me uh, as far as today's discussion is concerned please note down it's a type of a wading bird they feed primarily on algae that is largely found in the mud flats all right and as they feed on algae the carotenoid pigment in the algae is what gives them the pink color the pink coloration of their feathers is a result of the carotenoid pigment which comes from the algae that they consume all right they use their beaks to strain out the algae and even the small crustaceans from water the flamingo they have a very unique beak structure and they pick the water in such a way that it will strain the excess water which allows algae and small crustaceans to be retained in their beak all right so that is a, a unique adaptation of the flamingos and the reason why they stand on one leg it's a very iconic stance of the flamingos it, they are known for standing on their one leg because they draw the other leg closer to their body and scientists believe this is to conserve heat to conserve body heat to keep up their body temperature as they stand in water for long hours it's believed it's a adaptation the, that the bird has gone through they lift one leg keep it closer to their body to conserve heat potentially that is the prediction or that is the assessment of several experts in india you can find the flamingos you have lesser flamingos and greater flamingos in india the two subspecies all right lesser flamingos and greater flamingos both can be found in india lesser flamingos are near threatened according to iucn red list whereas greater flamingos are of least concern there is no concern with regard to greater flamingo population all right but lesser flamingos are seen as near threatened they are classified as near threatened on iucn red list the other categories of flamingos like american flamingo is of least concern again the chilean flamingo is of near threatened status and the andean flamingo please note this it's a threatened species endangered it's listed as vulnerable it's a threatened species listed as vulnerable on the red list of iucn is that clear so the broad flamingo species itself is of least concern but the subspecies have different classifications all right so please take a look at the iucn red status of the different subspecies of flamingos in india we can find lesser and greater flamingos they are found in the kutch region the run of kutch which we were just talking about in the marshy wetlands of kutch region of gujarat the sambar lake of rajasthan and from here they migrate to mumbai and thane during winter season during every winter season all right these migratory birds they fly from the kutch region of gujarat the sindh region of pakistan sambar lake of rajasthan they fly from here to mumbai mumbai thane creek where we have a flamingo sanctuary all right according to the bnhs the bombay natural history society around 133000 flamingos were documented recently 
and this is where you find a flamingo population in India's wetlands. At the Sambar Lake, in the Kutch region, the run of Kutch, marshy areas of Gujarat and the Mumbai Thane Creek Flamingo Sanctuary and places like Savri Nava which are on the outskirts of Mumbai near Thane. Alright, so please remember the locations where they can be found, their unique traits, their conservation status and that could be helpful for your prelims. So this completes my comprehensive analysis of today's the Hindu newspaper. Please take a look at the mains practice questions. I hope you guys write an answer because these are topics which I have covered in detail. I have given a detailed explanation on both the topics. The question is directly linked to what we have covered. Alright, so please try to write an answer because it's only through practice you can improve your answer writing skills. Understood? And I hope it was a good fruitful session. Do let me know how it went. I'll see you again tomorrow. Till then, take care. Have a good day.